How you doing, brother? What's up? How you doing? Back like we never left. Absolutely. Appreciate you coming out. No problem. How's it feel to be back at the Jack? Feels great. Feels like I never left. Back at Jack Kaiser Stadium, St. John's University, on the baseball field, what kind of emotions are you feeling coming back to the place where you won a Big East championship and where you kind of grew up as a man under Coach Blankmeyer to really get yourself into pro baseball and just overall as a professional? Honestly, it feels like I it feels like I played here so long ago, but um, you know those few years that I played on the St. John's team were were definitely some of the best years of my life, and you know some of those guys that I played with are, are still some good friends to this day. Um, the first time I knew that I wanted to be a Johnny was actually in 2009 when I went to see St. John's play Georgetown at City Field, and I really considered myself a Johnny ever since that game in 2009. So Coach Ed Blankmeyer, he's a Hall of Fame coach all time, great program here at St. John's. What did he teach you to become the best baseball player possible? I think he taught everyone on the team in general just how to become a man, you know, how to really take care of their business on and off the field. Um, you know, college baseball is, is really a grind. It could be even more of a grind than professional baseball just because, you know, you have early morning lifts, you're practicing a lot more than a pro ball. You're basically with the team the whole off season per se. And um, you're, you're taking 15 credits per semester. So, you know, you have to deal with, you know, living the college life, but also, you know, grinding and practicing every day as if you're a professional baseball player. So, you know, the coaches definitely help, um, help guide us in the right direction as far as that. And it's not just um, lessons during college, but life lessons as well. So fast forward to 2015, yep. you're a Big East champion at St. John's. The next big thing in your life is you decide to leave school and you decide to go into the MLB draft where you're selected by the Chicago White Sox in the 27th round. Take me through what you were feeling to be drafted after the culmination of your college baseball career after going through everything growing up and realizing your dreams of being a pro baseball player. Yeah, so you know, kind of starting in high school, I was told by a lot of travel coaches not even to look at St. John's, you know, so if, if those coaches are telling me not to look at, you know, a lot of Division One schools, including St. John's, in my head, I've, you know, I've no chance of playing professionally. But, you know, once, once I committed to St. John's, and then um, some major league teams started looking at me my senior year of high school, you know, my focus and, you know, my belief that I could make it to the big leagues or get drafted, you know, was was starting to come true, and I and I started to realize that I have the capability of doing that. So you know, fast forward three years later, and I'm draft eligible again. My junior year of college, it was definitely um, it was definitely an exciting moment in my life, especially you know after just within a few weeks of winning the Big East tournament regular season, and and obviously doing pretty well in the in the regional. So those were definitely um, exciting times for me that year. So. With that being said, you're Chicago White Sox now. You're in that organization. You've played in the spring training. You've played against the guys like Eloy Jimenez and Jose Abreu. Now here you are with some of the biggest names in sports. How does that feel to know you finally made it? And what kind of mental preparation did you have to do to say, okay, I'm here and I have what it takes to stay? Yeah, I think, I think it all changed after my first batter face in Pro Bowl. So when I flew out to Arizona, they started me in the rookie level Arizona League over there. Um, I, we had practice for about four or five days, and then we were thrown right into games. Um, I pitched in the first game during the, during the season. I came in with uh, two outs and I think one or two guys on base, and I struck out the first batter I faced. I was, I was extremely nervous that first batter, probably more nervous than any batter I faced in my life. You know, after that strikeout, and I, I came in the dugout because obviously there were two outs that inning. You know, it was definitely a sigh of relief, and it kind of, it kind of gave me that belief that I'm good enough to play with these guys. You know, so, it, you know, really my confidence kind of shifted drastically after that, after that one batter I faced, and I, and I realized that you know, I'm, I'm still playing against human beings, and human beings are not perfect. And, you know, as long as I play to the best of my ability, I can still compete at this level. So ultimately, the Chicago White Sox agreed to trade you to the Baltimore Orioles. Now you have to prove yourself all over again. What kind of view did that give you as a baseball player? Be like, okay, now I have to do it all over again after everything I've been through with Chicago. Yeah, so it's definitely, um, there's definitely positives and negatives of being traded. Um, 
you know, obviously when you're traded, it means another team, you know, values you. So, you know, it's a good thing in that perspective. At the same time, I was traded, um, I was traded, you know, a few weeks into the season. So it's a little bit more of an adjustment than, let's just say, getting traded in the off season, where you have time to adjust, talk to people, kind of understand what the organization is all about. So there were definitely a lot of adjustments to be, to be made, especially in the minor leagues where there's development going on. So since I was traded in May to a new organization at the, you know, at the high A level, you know, there's definitely a lot of adjustments to be made. So, um, you know, that was definitely a challenge for me that first year, getting traded, them kind of letting me do my own thing. And then after a few weeks of watching me from basically an outside perspective, you know, making some adjustments. And it, it's really tough to make adjustments during the season. So that, that was definitely a, a, a huge challenge for me. So one of the things that the pro baseball team saw out of you was your strikeout ability. Throughout the minor league career that you've had so far, you have about 204 strikeouts in 200 innings. So you're sitting low 90s in the fastball, you have a power slider that can punch a lot of people out, and not only do the MLB teams notice this, but World Baseball Classic Team Israel notices that. So in 2017, you're now on the roster and you're playing the Netherlands. Tell me exactly what you're thinking Again, because you're in a different organization, but you're still going against some of the best MLB hitters that the league has to offer, like Jerickson Profar and like Xander Bogarts. Yeah, that was that was definitely a thrill for me. Um, that the first pitch that I threw in the World Baseball Classic in the opening game against Korea, that was that was a totally different feeling than I ever felt when I pitched before. I've never had that much adrenaline before, and obviously I've never pitched in front of a crowd that big before. So. Um, you know, it's definitely it's definitely crazy to have that much adrenaline and pitch. You quickly realize that you have to control yourself and you have to, con you know, basically control the adrenaline and you know control control as much as you can. Because if you have that much adrenaline and you're out of whack, it, it could be dangerous. You could be all over the place. You know, and I'm surprised more big leaguers aren't all over the place, especially with a crowd that big. But you know, I was able to control my emotions, even even though I've never pitched in a crowd anywhere near, you know. Anywhere near probably five or ten thousand fans. I, the most I probably pitched in front of was maybe two, two to five thousand, and now I'm pitching in front of you know thirty-five thousand to fifty-five thousand fans. So you know it was pretty surreal, and not only that, but you know facing big league all stars. But you know I, once again, once I was able to you know get a few swings and misses and get guys to strike out or ground out or or pop out, you quickly realize that you know. You, that if you play to your ability, you, you're, you know, you're able to compete with these guys. So that's a great point, and I want to bring up the next thing. While you continue your baseball career, you also started a side hustle that ultimately became something that you were very passionate about. Let me see if you recognize these. Tell me about them. Yep. These are stadium custom kicks, custom cleats. Your own business company that you design custom shoes and custom cleats for not only professional football, baseball, basketball players, but minor leagues, college, high school. Now, if I'm correct, you have over 150 minor leaguers that you made shoes for, as well as professional athletes like Aaron Judge, Baker Mayfield, Danny Valencia, Robinson Cano. So using your connections as a professional athlete, how much easier was it for you to get in that network and start designing things like these for those athletes? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of it is the power of social media. Don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't know everybody, but at the same time, being a professional athlete and playing on many different teams, you know, and friends knowing, fr friends having friends or teammates from other teams, it, it definitely helps, you know. So, um, you know, it started basically with teammates seeing my cleats and then them wanting to get similar designs and then their friends seeing you know their friends from outside organizations or different teams seeing their cleats and wanting some so um, definitely networking word of mouth is huge when it comes to um, you know, doing business or anything like that what's the end game with the custom shoe game because you've done pros you've done minor leaguers you've done college players you've done high school players even little league players what are you trying to do? Are you ultimately trying to be somebody that's doing exclusively professionals? No, def definitely not. Um, obviously, there are plenty of professional athletes out there. Um, just in the major leagues, you know, there's I don't know 600 plus major league baseball players. So, 
you know, I mean, you could, you could run a business if, you know, if you get a majority of that market, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm not going to limit myself, you know, so obviously you don't want to grow too, too fast. You want to be able to handle everything and you don't want turnaround times um, to be too long because, you know, when people spend a couple hundred dollars or a few hundred dollars on a custom piece, a custom, some custom footwear, they don't want to wait. They don't want to wait too, too long. They're, they're excited the day they purchase it. But, um, you know, the goal is to become the number one customizer in every sport and definitely grow our, um, our, online, our online platform where people can just go on the website and, and purchase stuff. Um, there's not really, there's very few customizers, if any, that um, have custom footwear for sale on their website, especially in all different sports. You know, I've seen like regular lifestyle and basketball shoes, but not, you know, basketball, baseball, tennis, soccer, football, all the different sports. So, who's the next big name that you're designing for? Uh, like, I can't tell Come you on, can yet. Can you tell me that? I can't tell you yet, but I, I can say we're going to be working with a lot of uh, colleges and a lot of college football programs coming up soon. So, that'll be, that'll be huge because, you know, those, those rosters are, are pretty big and college football gets a lot of exposure. So, I think that's going to be pretty cool. No, that's absolutely great. Uh, you've definitely dominated the shoe market and... You know, I've seen your stuff over social media, and I've seen a lot of athletes like Robinson Cano, like an Iron Judge, wearing them. And every time I see them, I'm like, oh, Alex Katz, you know, it's his business, and he's really starting to take off with this shoe company. So I think you're doing a lot of great things, and I want to wish you the best of luck and success, and I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. From Jack Kaiser Stadium, I'm John Venezia.